Hey guys, real quick before the video, I just want to let you know what you're about to see is actually me recording a podcast. So I, I've started trying out podcasting and so I'm kind of recording it uh, mostly for patrons, but I'm going to release it to the public here. So the information will be kind of below, uh, for that if you're interested in listening versus watching, because it is just kind of me talking to the camera like this. What I would love for you is for you to tell me if, you like this content. If you would like to see this on the channel, it is definitely a kind of an industry deep dive. It's very much a high level kind of discussion topic point of view on a certain part of the board game industry, uh, along with a little bit of news and whatnot. Anyway, guys, just want to let you know, it's just me talking to the camera. Uh, I'll mention podcast and say you can't see me, but that's because I'm recording for the podcast. But I figured turn on a camera and see if you like to see this on YouTube as well. Anyway, guys, uh, let's get right to it. Hello and welcome to The King's Rant, the podcast that brings you board game news and the most important opinions on the industry, mine. I am your host Michael and today I'll be talking about a Gen Con update because that just wrapped up. I'll be doing a Kickstarter update and then the main focus of today will be about big business board game practices. If that doesn't scare the crap out of you, just wait. I'd like to throw things out just by saying that Kill Team looks amazing from Games Workshop. It's kind of their new uh, skirmish level, um, kind of squad based, smaller scale um, kind of board game, kind of tabletop game. It comes with a whole lot of cards and reference cards and uh, its own rule book. But the, even the terrain is like 3D plastic terrain that looks fantastic. And I really dig the fact that I don't have to invest $1,000 into. Uh, a, a huge army and instead can spend a thousand dollars getting all of the different squads i much prefer that <laughs> if i'm going to spend a thousand dollars i may as well do that right anyway miniature market has it on sale currently for 110 dollars which is like 20 bucks off so of the like their normal price which is i think already lower than you can get it elsewhere either way pretty good deal now i'm going to start out with uh, a a, a Gen Con update that isn't necessarily about board games. So Jeremy from Unsleeved Media, which if you don't know what Unsleeved Media is, it, it, it it's a YouTube channel that covered a lot of uh, Magic the Gathering uh, for a while. I think he has another channel now and has gone a lot more um, political within the industry, talking about um, you know the different people and their opinions and whether they're good for the industry and all that stuff. I'm not going to get into it. Uh, I might talk more about why I'm not going to get into it in the bonus episode of the podcast, but suffice it to say, it's pretty much just a uh, channel focus um, issue. E either way, he was at Gen Con, um, but kind of at a bar, uh, you know, kind of late at night that evening, and uh, was allegedly assaulted and punched in the face quite a few times. That's not not cool. We shouldn't punch people. Um, again, not, not, not going too into it, just, you know, we should be able to go to Gen Con safely, regardless of who you are or how you talk to others so anyway that happened and that's kind of crazy i don't know of anything else that's happened like that at gen con before so uh if you go to gen con stay safe okay next actual board game news privateer press partnered with fantasy flight games to create a sort of loot box uh so this is 16.99 a month and you get one miniature yeah i i paused for effect there so i i apologize for the silence but I'm I'm trying to grapple with this. So it's in, and this is just like a normal sized miniature. This is a regular. Well, it's not a regular miniature. It is a and you can't see this on the podcast, but these are these are air quotes here. These are exclusive and limited edition miniatures for sixteen ninety nine a month. But don't worry, don't worry. You can get the six month deal, which isn't just a six month deal. It's the VIP six month deal. So you become a very important purchaser <laughs> uh if you do the six months for only a hundred dollars a little bit less a hundred dollars and they'll throw in a free miniature that's right you get seven miniatures for a hundred dollars now now i understand that um if you get really good deals from like bulk orders and stuff like that it can twist how you value things so i'm i'm a heavy kickstarter backer and uh obviously i back a lot of kickstarters and typically the price range is about a hundred bucks. And oftentimes that ends up being a dollar a miniature or two dollars a miniature. 
And these aren't, and, and that's like an average, whereas the miniatures, there might be some that are small, and most are normal size, and some are quite large. And so it's kind of hard for me to justify getting only seven for a hundred. In fact, it's hard for me to justify getting seven 32, 35 millimeter miniatures for a hundred dollars from Games Workshop. Like that's expensive for that. Like, even if you were to get, like, the leader units, maybe, maybe with, like, some fancy basing and stuff like that, they'd be, like, maybe 20 bucks a pop, perhaps. But this doesn't look like that. It looks like just normal miniatures. I'm sorry, not normal miniatures. Exclusive and limited edition. So, that's, you know, that's my take on that. That's That seems outright silly and uh, preying on people who feel like they need to have it all. Um, more on that later, I suppose. <laughs> okay, all right. So... One last thing for the gaming update, and then we'll get to the Kickstarter update. Fantasy Flight Games also announced, I think it was actually, no, they did it during their uh, like event during Gen Con. Anyway, they announced a Super Star Destroyer for their Armada uh, game. Now, I'm a huge Star Wars fan. Um, not so much the new movies, but the old movies. I'm, I'm talking like old school movies, like 70s, 80s. Anyway, um, so uh, a huge Star Wars fan, so love the IP. Um, find that the, the board games are a bit expensive. <laughs> anyway, they announced that they are releasing in Q1 of 2019, the Super Star Destroyer for $200. Now this thing is about two feet long. Right? So, I don't know. Maybe that. If, you, if I'm holding my hands up about two feet across. Um, and it's just... So going back to Games Workshop, that's Games Workshop pricing mechanics, which you you don't typically see in the board game industry, or even a lot of other tabletop gamers, or a lot of tabletop companies don't do that because they're not Games Workshop, right? I mean, Games Workshop's Games Workshop. Uh, and, and what I mean by that is how the pricing works for Games Workshop is they do not price a product based off of how much it actually costs to make. Or even what the development costs were for to balance it or add the unit or create a new rule or add components or anything like that. They base it based off of how much they assume you're going to buy. What I mean by that is if they're releasing a single unit that you're supposed to buy once and you can't even have two of them in there, that unit will be priced much higher than if they had released uh, some troops that you can buy three or four and you're expected to maybe field three units of those. In other words, they're expecting you to buy three different boxes versus one box. And so the three boxes will actually probably be a pretty good deal. The one box would not be a good deal based off of what's in it. It's based off of the fact that you only have to buy it once. And that seems to be kind of like what this is. It takes up, I think, over half your points. It can then be piloted by Emperor Palpatine. All that's cool, by the way. But that's like half your points right there. So you're not fielding two of these. You will only ever buy one. And so they want to make sure that they can get their money from that. Now, I've seen it on sale for cheaper than 200 But I guess I'm just surprised that they're pricing it that way. And I think they might have been pricing Armada and uh, these kind of Star Wars stuff that way. Um Either way, I'm looking forward to next year. So next year, Gen Con, I'll probably have a podcast up and be prepared for me to talk about the basketball-sized Death Star that they released. That'll be kind of cool. It'll only be like, you know, 800 bucks. Okay, so that's it for the gaming news. Now, Kickstarter update. Obviously, this is just more board games, but this is specifically about Kickstarter. So first things first, Limbo Miniatures has finally released Eternal War on Kickstarter. That's a huge deal. As you know, on this channel, I've um, I've actively been talking about that for quite some time and, and kind of showing you guys everything. I actually have some of the miniatures I've been I've been painting up. Uh, I, I have one here that uh, it, 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 he's, he's pretty cool. He's like over 80 millimeters tall and complete resin and just he looks he looks really great. So can't wait to share those to you either way. Already it's a good deal. It's about two bucks a mini right now, and that's with one of them over 200 millimeters tall. So uh, a really good deal there. It's on Kickstarter for like another 20 days, so there's plenty of time to look into that and back it. And, you know, they throw a skirmish game on top of the miniatures, not just about the miniatures. Okay, next up, Bloodborne. No, not the card game, the board game. See, Cool Mini Knots now making that kind of, well... I shouldn't say they're making the card game a board game. They're developing a board game based off Bloodborne. Uh, I'm assuming that means miniatures, obviously, because otherwise they already have the card game uh, that Eric Lang did. And uh, that card game looked kind of 
kind of weird to me. Uh, pl- actually, having played the game, it just um, it, it's kind of like this semi co-op, but you're actually hurting each other card game. It reminded me a lot of like Bang the Dice game, where like like you you may be working together, but you're also like hurting each other all the time, and it, it's just kind of weird. That being said, a board game would be really, really cool. The aesthetic style of Bloodborne, if you haven't seen it, is amazing. It's like Victorian, I don't want to say Lovecraftian, because it's not, there. The no, without the tentacles, perhaps. Instead, there's more hair. <laughs> That's actually, I'm going to stick with that. It's, it's Lovecraftian, but replace all the tentacles with hair. And you have Bloodborne. That's probably pretty good. Okay. So, um, I don't know when I'm assuming that's going to come to Kickstarter, but I don't have any information on when that is. So I apologize for that. But if I find out, I'll let you guys know. Next up, Trudvang Legends. And this is for Q2 2019 Kickstarter. So this is like a long ways away. Apparently it's based off of a, uh, kind of a tabletop RPG, you know, the pen and paper kind. Um, that was a really, a really successful campaign before. And, uh, it, it features a lot of the art from like Paul Bonner, which you might recognize from, uh, like Zombicide guest boxes. I believe he's done a lot of those. Anyway, the art looks amazing. And the miniatures they already have are really good. You know how Coleman Not does this. They already have pretty much the core box probably completely done, art finalized, miniatures already, already ready to be produced. And then they're just going to be working on, you know, perhaps additional rules stuff and uh, Kickstarter exclusive stuff. So they'll be well prepared for their Q2 release in 2019 on Kickstarter. So look for that. Next up is Project Elite. This is a Q4 2018, which means fall or winter here. Um, So towards the end of the year, they're going to be coming out with this. I think this is a re-release too, where there used to just be like an elite and they added the, either, either way, my understanding is they added new miniatures and new rules and upgraded components and stuff like that. Uh, it, it's kind of, it looks kind of like a sci-fi board game. Um, I don't know. I don't know too much about it. They didn't really say a whole lot. The miniatures look cool from what I've seen, but they haven't, honestly, they have shown more of the Trudvang legends than I could find on Project Elite when I went looking for it. So, Kind of odd, but, you know, well, I guess we'll see what that is. Maybe it'll be one of their short Kickstarters. I don't know. Okay, last item here. Coleman or Not has been teasing their Starcadia Quest. That comes out August 28th at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, unless it releases later early. They're rarely quite right on time. Uh, I think they get a little little trigger happy there, but that's that's fine. Either way, really looking forward to that one. Starcadia Quest is Arcadia Quest from Coleman or Not set into space. And then dialed up to 11 and like the cuteness factor. Like the enemies all look adorable and funny and very Pixar like. And the heroes are super bright color. I'm looking forward to painting it just because I don't get to paint in bright purples and greens enough, right? I mean, this, it looks like a lot of fun. And I've missed all the other Arcadia Quest Kickstarters. So, um, this will allow me to finally get one. So that's cool. All right. Now, the big item. Big business practices in board games. Um, what do I mean by that? Let me ex- let me set the, the groundwork here, okay, with an analogy from video games. I grew up playing video games. I had an NES as a kid. Never had an SNES, by the way. I know that's that's kind of crazy and, and quite sad, I'm sure. I went through it from the NES to the N64, so my mind was, like, blown away. Like, I, I couldn't believe my eyes. <laughs> um, anyway, um, you know... So played them, uh, you know, as, as, as it came out, the SNES wasn't even quite out yet and, uh, really did enjoy video games. I still do. I used to enjoy them more when I could play them, but with this, um, YouTube channel and podcast and all this other stuff, uh, and family, you know, normal stuff like that. I, I, I just don't have the time anymore, which is kind of sad, but I'm still very passionate about the industry and that's where I'm getting at here. So back during, let's say the NES, right? Not everybody played video games. Only the the kind of the core group played video games, and they were super passionate. You could call them the nerds, right? We're super passionate about video games. And then slowly over time, video games grew and grew and grew, and especially as those nerds grew up and they became adults, I think that's that's kind of the generation shift there, and then their, their kids obviously play video games. Um, 
but it became more socially accepted and expanded and grew as an industry, which is fantastic. You always want more and more people to appreciate something that you appreciate, right? So that's that's cool. But that introduced kind of the uh, more um, casual is what I'm going to put in air quotes here. I don't mean that in a, in a derogatory way at all. And I'm into things that I'm not super like interested in everything about. I just kind of like it. Um and the difference there is that while they'll purchase games and, and not even just like, you know, the Madden or the World of Warcraft or, or something like that or the Call of Duty, but they'll actually purchase other games. Uh, normally, you know, the AAA games, the non-indie games and for video games, but they don't care about the industry, right? They're not that passionate about it. They just, it's just something they buy, right? The, the phone market, I think, has one like this too, where like, so there are people who are super interested in phones and the people who just don't care. And they're just going to buy the next Samsung or whatever, right? So what what that creates is an industry that most of the money made is from people who don't care about the industry. And what that allows for is big business to come in. What I mean by that is back when I played video games on the NES, it was video game developers who were video gamers making video games for other video gamers, <laughs> right? It was kind of the cyclical, all in cl- all wound together group of people that either consumed or made video games, but they were all video gamers. And now if you were to look at the CEO of Activision or EA or, or any of these big companies that make a lot of or most of the games out there, it's just suits. It's just men in suits. It's it's. People who aren't video, I mean, they'll, they'll play video games because they're in the industry right now, but they are not, they know how to run a business, right? And so their purpose, their passion is not video games. Their passion is money. They're, because they might move on to some other company. Maybe they'll go from, you know, that to a, you know, an oil company. Like it wouldn't matter, right? They're great at running businesses. There's nothing against businessmen either, just, a note that they aren't invested in the industry they are except in the fact that they can make money from it okay so if you have a group of people who don't care about the industry a large group of people who don't care about the industry run by an industry of people who don't care about anything except making money and you get stuff like you know battlefront 2 from ea which is a star wars game that uh did really bad because they they, you know, they went really heavy into the loot boxes and it's, so you would buy the game and you wouldn't be able to play Luke or Vader. You had to like either grind for like two months straight or purchase it, right? That, that, that sort of stuff. Um, where obviously they knew that gamers wanted it. And so their idea is, well, then let's lock it behind a paywall. But let's not give it to them because they want it. And if they want it, they'll pay for it. And that's what we care about, right? Okay. So bringing this back to board games. Sorry for that long, 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 long introduction. The board game industry is kind of, I would say, maybe ten, five to ten years behind the video game industry when it comes to its growth, right? I would consider the video game industry to be in kind of those late teen years, right? Where they're kind of rebellious and edgy, but they're also trying to be more mature and or think they're more mature and they're trying to figure out how they work in life, right? That sort of like awkward stage. We're in like the young teens, in board games where we're just awkward. <laughs> no, what, what, what I mean by that is um, it's just starting to expand and become acceptable target. Uh, I've, I've seen so many posts on my Facebook about people taking pictures of the board game section of their local target because they're starting to expand it and kind of like a slow kind of, you know, th- this target will expand and then this target will expand, you know, so that they don't just expand them all and then it, it fails. So they're, they're testing the waters. They're really, at, and it's not just Sailors of Catan. This is like dead of winter and uh, even ones I haven't even heard, of, like a lot of board games, a, a quite a big section. That's in Target. That's nationwide. That's, that's a, that's a big deal, right? We are becoming, the board game industry is becoming more and more acceptable and more and more popular and more and more people are playing board games. Uh, it's why we've had, you know, articles on like Wired and even like the New York Times about people playing board games and the benefits of that and, and all that sort of stuff. And that's great. But with that comes big business, right? Where there's money, big business, big business will follow. And, uh, and, and so I'd like to talk to you about, uh, Asmodee. <laughs> so Asmodee is a company that just buys board game companies. Uh, they own Days of Wonder. They own Fantasy Flight Games. They own, uh, they just bought like Mayfair. They own Plat Hat Games. They own all these different 
game companies. In fact, if you go to your friendly local gaming store and you put a line in half, I guarantee half of it is probably done actually by Asmodee as the publisher. Think EA or Activision, okay? And um, they were just bought out for like $1.4 billion. One company, $1.4 billion. Right, so obviously the board game is now uh, industry is a multi-billion-dollar industry, which is huge. And where there's billions of dollars to be made, people in suits that don't know board games, they don't care about board games per se, except in the fact that it can make them money. This should sound familiar. Start to make board games because they want to make money, and the people who run it are the people who are good at making money, not necessarily good at making board games. Does that make sense? Okay, so now that I've kind of drawn the parallel here, let, let me kind of explain what I've seen that's similar. So um, I first got into board games. I didn't play a gateway game. I didn't play, you know, Ticket to Ride. I've never played Tickets to Ride. I've never even played Catan, believe it or not. I've, I, I like bypassed those and went straight into like heavy dungeon crawlers. So I sold, I, I, I recently got back into Magic. Well, at the time I'd recently got back into Magic the Gathering and I pulled like some foil full art amazing land that I didn't care about because it was just a land but it was worth like 200 ish bucks so I went to the the local gaming store ABU games I actually live right near it and they, they apparently they're really big in the like online magic scene anyway um sold it to them and got in store credit because I got a little bit of a bonus which meant I had to go buy a board game and I had I'd done a little bit of research here to try and see what I could do and I went and got Descent Second Edition plus I think two expansions and played a ton of that. Love that. Fantastic game. Really enjoy it. It was the first miniatures I painted too, ever. And anyway, so we get the game and we're, we start to play it. And if you don't know how Descent works, you have all your heroes and you have all of your enemies. But the enemies are mostly just cannon fodder, except these like special enemies, which are kind of the equivalent to your hero. They have special moves and, and different kind of health and stuff like that. They're, they're essentially the enemies, which somebody plays, in my case, me, the overlord, uh, their hero units. However, you get a ton of miniatures in the game, except for the lieutenants. So you get the hero miniatures, you get the enemy miniatures, but the lieutenants, you get little tiny cardboard tokens with their picture printed on it. Now, why is that? Why did they remove those? Why didn't they remove the rats that I got? Why didn't they remove the spiders and just have spider tokens or even a standee? Well, the reason is because nobody would buy a spider miniature afterwards, but people would want to buy the story important and multiple scenario lieutenant. And so that's exactly what they did. Days of, or sorry, not Days of Wonder, Fantasy Flight Games, again, owned by Asmodee, which is now owned by probably some Chinese firm. I forget who bought them for that crazy amount. Anyway, they would sell the lieutenant miniatures in these packs for like 20 bucks. In fact, I, I almost want to say it was like $25, $27. And of course, it had the little miniature. And they were, again, just, they're smaller scale than 35 millimeter. These are tiny miniatures. So a tiny miniature with some cards and tokens um, that aren't even super necessary. But they threw that in to try and, I guess, justify the cost. I'm not sure. It, because it couldn't. That is a business move. That was done not to make the board game better. That was done not for the consumer. That was done to make money. Okay, so they sold the base game, but they wanted to add more money. That is a microtransaction. That is DLC. But I, I, I'm going to reserve DLC for something at least slightly expensive. That's a microtransaction. That's like I'm on my Android phone and I want to get, you know, 200 more energy or I want to unlock that character. So I'm going to try and do that. Okay, it's it's not random. It's just exploitive of the consumer. That is the big business move and that's been around i mean i, I don't know when descent second edition came out but years ago i mean that, that's been going on for a while right so now we get to this you know like the fantasy flight games thing and uh, they did that with imperial assault too and imperial assault if you wanted bubba fett you had to go get here and then if you wanted luke you had to go get here and if you want to see three like they weren't they were they were expanded out and grouped out in ways to where uh, i think bubba fett was in a big box expansion so if you wanted bubba fett at all you had to buy this like huge like $60 expansion or something like that. E either way, that's that's where I'm talking about here and it's bad for the industry. It's good because because you get to a point where it breaks down, right? They they will continue to test the waters and continue to see how much money they can make, how much profit margin they can shave off and, and increase on their side. Um what they don't have to include versus do have to include. Uh, for instance, they came out with Star Wars Legion. 
Star Wars Legion is kind of their tabletop game. It doesn't come with enough dice to make a full roll sometimes. You can have a situation where you need to roll all the dice it comes with and then note what you had and re-roll some more just to finish the first roll. Now, why would they not put enough dice in the game? Well, because upon launch, guess what you can buy? You can buy extra dice. How convenient. You didn't have enough dice in the core box, so don't worry, they'll add some more. That's what I'm talking about. That's ridiculous. It's stupid. It's just stupid, and it's got to stop. That's that's dumb, and we shouldn't allow it. But it's Star Wars. It's Star Wars tabletop. Oh my gosh, i got to have it. I like, like I, I could have a little tiny Luke Skywalker fighting Stormtrooper. Look, look. The point is a Star Wars license costs a lot. I get that. Now, obviously, with the Star Wars license, you're going to sell more and therefore make up for it. So I don't say that that needs to increase the cost of anything. But, because if this wasn't Star Wars, if this was like, I don't know, some other IP that's randomly made up, it would not sell like it has. Star Wars sells. So, don't even try to say it doesn't. It makes companies pompous it makes them confident overconfident it's like well i mean shoot there's nowhere else because it's always an exclusive deal anyway there's nowhere else you're going to get this star this this star wars miniatures game if you want a star wars miniatures game star wars legion that's what you got to buy and so with that they're like and eh, if you're gonna have to buy it guess what you're gonna have to buy some more dice too oh and these uh, units over here so you can get full points for an army and uh then all these other you know prices hey you want that that nice cool ship that'll be 200 bucks right? That's exactly what that is. So I, I don't know exactly how to solve it. Um, video game industry hasn't figured it out. Uh, like I said, Battlefront 2, the Star Wars Battlefront 2 from EA did uh, did did horribly, right? It, it collapsed upon itself. Uh, it was it was kind of the, the final straw, but uh, Shadows of Mordor, a uh, 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 Lord of the Rings game, had been just as bad before, but skated by. So I don't know how Again, you don't know when the last straw is going to land, right? But you don't want to be the last straw. Um, what I would hate, what I would hate, and what I'm going to end with here, is I would hate for um, somebody who is casual, somebody who's just trying to play a board game that isn't a board gamer, that doesn't know or care about the industry, find out they're disappointed. See that fancy Star Wars miniature game. Be like, you know what? I've never played a, a tabletop miniature game before. I've never played a skirmish game. And I love Star Wars. That looks so cool. I'm going to buy the starter kit. I'm going to go. And then get frustrated because they don't have enough dice. And then just call the whole thing off. There's nothing there to bring them back into a friendly local gaming store. There's nothing there to bring them back in. They don't care about the industry. They're brand new. So if they have a bad experience, it's, they're just going to leave. And that's, that's unfortunate. That's too bad. Uh, I don't want to see that happen. So I guess... We just need to be conscientious about what we purchase and what we back on Kickstarter and what, how we act as consumers, which is part of why I try to um, hopefully curate some some stuff that I believe in that I think you can back. Uh, I do that on my YouTube channel a lot, um, you know, j j just so you can be, I guess, a better informed backer and a better informed consumer, so you don't get that big business. Uh, getting you when you don't want it to. All right, guys, that's it. Thanks for listening. Again, if you like the podcast, be sure to spread the word and note that uh, my patrons on Patreon do get these episodes early, plus access to a bonus episode exclusively for them, which is mostly just kind of behind the scenes. But that's that happens every single month. As always, I appreciate your feedback. So let me know what you liked. Let me know what you didn't quite like and let me know what you might like in the future. You can find me anywhere. There is social medias, Facebook, Instagram. I have my YouTube channel. All that's under the King of Average Patreon. You can reach me there. Um, I would love to hear what, what your thoughts are. The music in today's episode was licensed under the Creative Commons license by DJK and Kevin McLeod. Again, this is Michael from the King of Average, and I look forward to talking with you again on the King's Rant.